In 1910, New York City slated 300 buildings over an 11 block stretch to be demolished to make way for the, seventh, for the construction of 7th Avenue and the subway line that runs beneath it. The Times reported that the construction would, quote, ruthlessly cut through the neighborhood, destroying many curious residences and businesses. The tenants and owners of those residences and businesses made a loud protest against the city's decision, but in the end, the city claimed the properties through eminent domain, and so the buildings were lost. One landowner in particular fought tooth and nail against the demolition. David Hess, who lived in Philadelphia, owned the Voorhis apartment building directly in the path of the proposed construction. He refused to have his property claimed and raised by the city, and so he tried every legal means at his disposal and exhausted everything trying to stop that demolition. But eminent domain cannot be stopped. By 1914, the Voorhis was gone. <clears throat> Some years later, after Hess's death, his heirs discovered that the city surveyor had made a mistake. A small portion of the old Voorhis property was left undeveloped, and as his heirs, they had a legal claim to it as part of his estate. When the city found out, they asked the Hess family to donate that small piece of land. After all, there was hardly anything to it. It was barely worth anything, just a, a triangle about two feet on a side. Frank Hess, David's executor, described it as scarcely large enough for the erection of a slot machine. But the family was still angry about the seizure of the Voorhis, and so they refused the city's request, and they even went to court to claim their property. In 1922, they marked the space with a small plaque which reads, The property of the Hess estate, which has never been dedicated for public purposes. The Hess Triangle, or the Spite Triangle, as it's sometimes called, stands to this day on the corner of 7th Avenue and Christopher Street as, a, as the Hess family's judgment against the city's overreach. Now, to New Yorkers, this is a story of a little guy standing up to an overbearing government. It's a cautionary tale about the gutting of an entire neighborhood, all in the service of shaving a few minutes off a trip downtown. But setting aside for a moment all the arguments about whether or not it was right for the city to take the property, I can't help but think about how this story is as much about the refusal of Hess and his heirs to accept the inevitable. They could have simply donated the property and been done with it. Instead, they chose to invest the time and the court fees, probably spending well over the $100 it was worth, and to leave that message on it as a lasting testament to their displeasure. When I hear this story, I don't hear a judgment against the city of New York. I hear a judgment against the Hesse's pettiness and greed. Of course, I don't know the whole story and I can't really judge, but it's hard not to draw some conclusions when looking at this tiny self-authored testament to their spite. During the season of Advent, we intentionally take time to pause, to look ahead to what is coming. The second epistle of Peter calls us to watch and to prepare for the coming reign of God, a reign of justice and peace. But just as New York had to tear down some buildings to make way for 7th Avenue, there are also some things that will need to be demolished to make way for God's reign. The letter tells us, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. The letter reminds us that in spite of its apparent tardiness of its fulfillment, God has a claim of eminent domain over the entire earth, and eminent domain cannot be stopped. Just like David Hess, we know what's coming regardless of whether we welcome the promise of God's reign or fear it. The question that these readings invite us to reflect upon 
is what it means for us to prepare the way of the Lord in our own lives. From what are you being called to repent? What is there within your heart or within our society that holds us back from, from embracing God's reign of justice and peace? What are those things that we hold on to both as individuals and as a people, a nation, a human race, that risk becoming spite triangles, standing forever in judgment against us? When we look at this world around us, we can all see many different ways that this world groans in anticipation for God's intervention. This pandemic has served only to highlight many of those problems. Issues of racism and poverty, the hatred and the distrust that exists between us and our neighbors, the privilege that we have so successfully used to insulate ourselves from the suffering of others. The pandemic has torn off our blinders and forced us to acknowledge not only that these things exist, but that they are actively harming us, all of us, that they contribute not only to the rate of infection, but to the slow destruction of our society and our world. When I hear texts like these, my first instinct as a preacher is to rally the troops, to call people from their quietude and their passivity and to get busy preparing the way of the Lord. These texts make me see all the ways that we resist and or ignore God's eminent domain. And I feel compelled to call us all to start burning down these sins of ours ahead of God's reign to hasten that coming day of God. And that's the sermon I started writing this week, a sermon of which John the Baptist would have been proud, a good old-fashioned fire and brimstone called repentance. But on further reflection, I came to realize that that's not the sermon God was calling me to preach. It's a sermon born of my own frustration over the brokenness of the world and the things that I can't change. My anger and my sorrow over those things sometimes blinds me to the true message of the gospel, as well as to the ministries that you all faithfully carry out every day. I become as stubborn and as hard-headed as Hess, and that prophetic rage becomes my own little spite triangle standing in judgment, not against the world, and not against you, but against myself. I'm starting to think that wanting to preach those kinds of sermons is more about me feeling like God is calling me to greater action than it is about you. And so for me, and I hope for you as well, these texts bring good news. And that news is that neither you, nor I, nor any one of us, nor all of us together, can create God's reign on earth. Only God can do that. God has called each of us to play a part in that coming reign, to lead lives of holiness and godliness as we await its coming. But what that means is different for each of us. Isaiah and John the Baptist and the writer of 2 Peter, they were all called to offer words of guidance and incitement and comfort. And because they did, we've all been blessed. But we are not all called to be Isaiah's or John's or Peter's. Each of us has been uniquely invited by God to love the world around us in our own way. And whenever and however we answer those calls, the world is blessed just as much as by the soaring poetry of Isaiah, or the fiery apocalyptic of Peter, or the proleptic ministry of John. This season of Advent calls us out of our complacency to watch for what is coming, to consider how we will respond to God's call and prepare for God's kingdom most faithfully. That doesn't necessarily mean doing more than we are, but it might. It doesn't necessarily being a better person than I already am, but it might. What work we are called to do will be different for each of us 
and it will change over time. Keeping watch means to keep looking for your answer to that question of how you will respond to God's call, even if you've already found it. As you can see, I too am still trying to figure out what God is calling me to. If it seems daunting to think about all the work that needs to be done to heal this world, that's because it is. Thankfully, Brother John is here today to remind us that one more powerful than us is coming, that that one will accomplish what we cannot. If it seems like that promise is a long way off, that it might never get here, my brother Peter reminds us that God is being patient with us, giving us the time that we need to get our affairs in order and prepare for that day to figure out how best to respond to God's invitation. After all, my beloveds, God is not slow in the way that we think about slowness. The reign of God is not yet here, but at the same time, it's already come. Wherever God's children lead lives of holiness and godliness, God reigns. Wherever love is stronger than hate or fear, God reigns. Wherever a cup of cool water is offered in Jesus' name, God reigns. In the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us in our baptism, we have already each been given everything that we need to do what God is calling us to do. Today we remember that the eminent domain of God cannot be stopped, that the lines have been drawn and all that stands in the way of God's promises has been slated for demolition. Nothing that we do or don't do can stop it. But knowing what is coming, what sort of persons will we be? What sort of persons is God calling us to be? How will you respond to God's invitation? Knowing what is coming, where can we watch for and look for the signs that it is already beginning to appear? <laughs>